Let's welcome Pastor Alex as he comes this morning. Thank you. Man, that's good. Good morning. You guys are good? It's been a while since I've been up here. I hope I can make it. Y'all can tell y'all need to pray for me today. My voice, I don't feel as bad as I sound, but um, it was totally gone on Friday, and we got a little bit of it back today, but uh, we're going to uh, get through that. I'm going to try not to uh, uh, belt anything out. Do you feel safe? Do you feel safe? <laughs> Good. Good. Um, Kelly's got something she wants to share. I won't, come on up. And, um, you can grab that right there. You ready? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't, there, the Lord has spoken already this morning. If you're paying attention, he's already spoken. He's spoken to the church and he's given us a message. If you listen. You know, half the songs that we did this morning were on the fly. Half the songs were in the spirit. They were words that Michael was getting to bring to the church so that the church could align itself with the Lord. Can you hear me say, come, I'm all need and then Stephen says if you've got your if you've got if you're flying any other flag other than the banner of the Lord you're flying the wrong flag I'm a I'm a uh, incredibly grateful I'm a veteran I served our nation I love this country I thank God that I can live here but it is not my savior. The banner over me is love. Amen. 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 Kelly, won't you read that real quick, Isaiah? Um. So this past Thursday, I don't really do this often, so it's kind of weird for me to speak out. But um, this past Thursday was the last week of um, our 11-week Bible study, um, doing breaking free with some of the women in the church and. Um, we've been reading through Isaiah basically the entire time, so it's one of our favorites now. But um, I wanted to read Isaiah 58. I don't know, God just put it on my heart to read it to you guys, so if you can just agree with me on it. Um, about, you know, it just talks about all the things that are kind of going on in our nation and shining, being a light, you know, within the darkness kind of thing. So I'm going to go ahead and read it. Um, it's verse 6. I will tell you the kind of day I want, a day to set people free. I want a day that you take the burdens off others. I want a day that you set troubled people free and take the burdens from their shoulders. I want you to share your food with the hungry. I want you to find the poor who don't have homes and bring them into your homes. When you see people who have no clothes, give them your clothes. Don't hide from your relatives when they need help. If you do these things, your light will begin to shine like the light of dawn. Then your wounds will heal. Your goodness will walk in front of you, and the glory of the Lord will come following behind you. Then you will call to the Lord, and he will answer you. You will cry out to him, and he will say, Here I am. Stop causing trouble and putting burdens on people. Stop saying things to hurt people or accusing them of things they didn't do. Feel sorry for hungry people and give them food. Help those who are troubled and satisfy their needs. Then your light will shine in the darkness. You will be like the bright sunshine at noon. The Lord will always lead you and satisfy your needs in dry lands. He will give you strength to your bones. You will be like a garden that has plenty of water, like a spring that never goes dry. Your cities have been destroyed for many years, but you will rebuild them and their foundations will last for a long time. And this is my favorite part. You will be called fence fixer and builder of roads and houses. Amen. Uh, I titled this message this morning, God Waits, but I changed it to come to me. I'm all you need. Amen. Incredible passage of scripture. As I'm, you know, getting older and, uh, you know, walking through this Christian life, still learning how to follow God. How many of you know that you don't get too old to learn how to follow God? 
He teaches us so much. And one of the things that we have to realize is that we really haven't been getting the scriptures and and they haven't really been available to everybody on the planet, but less than 500 years. You know, we're coming to a place where we, we understand that the Scripture is true. And it's, it's without error. But man doesn't have it figured out. And what we've made the mistake of doing for so long is theologians want to, uh, you to respect them to such a degree that they... They communicate in different ways that they've got the Word of God figured out and that you can, that you can rest on. And there, there are promises and things in the Word that, that we can rest on and that we can understand and, and that we can build our lives on. They're foundational things. They're, things. they're promises of God that we can say they're for me and they're yes and they're amen. <clears throat> but there are other things that you know, how many of you have ever looked at a passage of Scripture and you got the meaning of it and then you read it a year later when you were going through something else and it just went boom. It just jumped out at you in a whole different way. It didn't lose the first meaning. It just broadened itself. You know, it gave you more information. It didn't contradict what you read the first time. It just explained the glory of God better. But right now, there's this controversy going inside your pastor. And this is it. There's a group, there's a theological group who say that things are just going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And it, all hell is going to break loose. And, and it's just going to be incredibly hard to live on this planet because we're going to be so few and that, and that Jesus is going to come back and rescue us. And then there's another group on the planet that says, no, 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 that's not the way it's going to be. Don't you know that the church was here to bring heaven to earth. And so God is going to use the church to right the wrongs, to bring the glory of God to a place where we dominate and we correct and we fix. And when that happens, then Jesus is going to come back. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? I just messed everybody up in the room. But the truth of the matter is, I don't know. You? I don't know. I mean, they both sound pretty good. We know that when we live, there's going to be great tribulation. Jesus said that as long as you're on this planet, you're going to have tribulation. He says, blessed is the man who is persecuted for my name's sake. So we know that we're persecuted and that we are uh, Look down upon by God with a smile because he knows that we're lining up with him. But in the same vein, Acts chapter 2 quotes Joel and says, In the last days, says the Lord, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And they're going to dream dreams. And they're going to have visions. And they're going to be able to see things in the spirit that have never been seen before. That day is now. We're there. Right? So you got this war waging between spirit and kingdom and worldliness and flesh and the religions of, of the world. And we see it right now in our nation probably like we've never seen it before. I mean, there is a great divide. There is 50% of America in one camp, basically, and 50% of America in another camp. And there are Christians on both, in both sides. Then there's great confusion in the Christian community, I think, of the message of God and who's on God's side and who's not on God's side. And I just want to clear something up to you, maybe help you, I hope, in this process of thinking this thing through. If Hillary Clinton would have won the election, whether I voted for her or not, and you could say, oh Lord, if you want, but it was, oh Lord, who would have brought her into office. And as a Christian person, my responsibility 
was to pray for her, was to believe that my God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all I can imagine or think in her life so that she could govern and bring the kingdom of God. Whether she believed or not, my God is able to do that. And the same is true for Trump. And so our banner is not flying over a government, a form of government, whether we have the majority of, of Republicans in the House and the Senate now with a Republican president. That makes absolutely no difference. And I hear things, see you know, things on the net that don't, say, you know, don't tell people not to fear, but let me just tell you something. Scripture says, do not fear. Do not fear. And I know that, that there are thoughts and processes on both sides that would cause that. But the reason I can say that with confidence this morning is that my God is able to handle anybody in authority. He puts them there. He sets the stars in place. He establishes policy. And he even gets them the votes. He gets them the votes. If you don't think God did what just happened, you know, you need to have confidence that he's at work. Otherwise, Satan's in control. He's just not. Right? Because we're flying the right flag. The banner over me is love. And it matters not what man is in control or in authority. My God is in authority and he has defeated hell. Amen. Okay. So, what he's saying to the church is come to me. That's the message. Don't be fearful. Don't gloat. Because I could use this president for your destruction to humble this nation. So don't gloat. Be humble. Seek your God. Put your expectations in his ability to bring peace on earth and goodwill to men. Right? And so I want to give you some stories because how it happens, it, it, it's going to happen in the church. Whether you believe this one, which says there's doom and gloom coming, but the church has to be strong, you still have to be a remnant, right? Even if that's the way, there's going to be a remnant that's saved. If it's the other way, we need to be exuding the glory of God. That the only way society will ever be changed is if the church is transformed into the likeness of Christ. And so that we can love and encourage and, and, and just help people find that God is good and His ways are righteous. In humility and love and peace. There's a few stories that I just kind of want to talk about that, that there, are, there are messages. The first one is the story of Samson is found in Judges chapter 13 is where it begins. And it's an incredible story. And then I, I want to talk to you this morning too about another story. It's the, it's the ten lepers in, in Luke chapter 17. Ten lepers that, that have this encounter with Jesus. And and. and, and, and then the last one is going to be the woman with the issue of blood who, who Jesus healed. Now, the reason I want to tell these stories is because they're all stories of real people. And these real people, even though Samson is listed in Hebrews as a father of the faith, that we can look to him as somebody who pursued God. Samson, if you would agree with me, has some pretty real issues. And, and, and those issues were ever, they're glaring issues. And, and even though he was considered a man of God, his life was terrible. He had a horrific life and a horrific death. And the reason being, he did not align himself with the ways of God. Even though he had the anointing of God on his life from a young age, God had a plan for Samson. 
He anointed Samson to carry out that plan. And in the midst of that plan, Samson began to do what he wanted to do in his own mind. And as he made those decisions that were contrary to the ways of God, he began to reap the consequences of his choices that were outside righteousness. If you remember the story of Samson, he saw this hot Philistine. He had this good-looking woman. And the Lord had already told him, you know, you don't intermarry. But he had this design that he wanted to bring down the nation of the Philistines, the, the culture of the Philistines that was contrary to his way. And uh, he had picked Samson to do that. And, and how he did it was he brought Samson's eye to this woman, or Samson and I went to that woman, and God just, just allowed it to happen, and he did some neat things. But he had called Samson to several things. The first thing he did, he told his mama, this is going to be a Nazarite. And a Nazarite meant that he didn't shave his head, he never cut his hair. He never had any wine or strong drink. There are only three of those in Scripture for, for, for you from, the, the, uh, uh, from that background. There's only three people who just didn't drink any alcoholic beverages in the scripture. That's just, that's just information for you religious people. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Honey, I thought I'd get a lot more laugh than that. <laughs> anyway, then I'll cut the hair. Don't touch any unclean thing. And it's important to know those things because what we see is we see Samson flirting with disaster. The first thing he does is he sees this woman and he says, I know she's not of my religion. I know she's got other gods in her life and she's influenced by other ways of thinking, but she's hot. And, and she looks good to my eye and it sounds good to me that I go get that right there. There's something in scripture that tells us as Christians that we're not to be unequally yoked. And there's a reason for that. It's because we be, it's so easy for us to begin to adopt ways of thinking that are counter-biblical ways of thinking when we adopt that thing. And that's why he says don't do that in business because you have different principles and practices in business if you come from different religions. He says don't be unequally yoked. And so Samson sees this beautiful woman, and he says, I like that, Daddy. Go get her for me. And Daddy says, well, isn't there an Israelite that you can get? And he goes, no, 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 I like that. And so he goes and marries that. And then it doesn't work out real good. And she's actually given away to one of his friends. That's a bummer. Everybody say bummer. And it's a bummer. <laughs> So next, he, he, uh, he's chasing around out in the, in the wilderness, and he's looking at, at the different cultures, and, he, and a lion attacks him, and he kills the lion with a jawbone. He kills the lion, bare hands. Pretty incredible feat. It says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he kills that lion, and then he's out about again, wandering around, looking at things that he shouldn't look at. Or, you know, he's going, he's delving into other cultures, and he sees that dead lion. And in that dead lion is a honeycomb, and there are bees in that honeycomb. And one of the things that he can't do is he can't touch any unclean thing or eat on any clean thing. It's a Nazarite. And what he does is he touches this dead animal, reaches in, grabs the honey, and eats the honey. A little bit later, if you'll read down the story, he actually made a rhyme about that, kind of making light of the fact that he did something that he wasn't supposed to do. I mean, he knows that God has called him to walk in this way, to come to him, to be an example of him, that he is anointed by God. He knows he's anointed, and yet he is, he is being deliberately disobedient to the ways and the thoughts of God. To the point that the last straw was, he goes and he sees this prostitute named Delilah. And Delilah cuts his hair, which his hair is never supposed to be trimmed. And he, he got in that predicament because he decided that he was going to do it his way because he liked the way it looked. And he got there in that condition and he suffered the consequences. 
but God was still using him. It's kind of amazing to me how that happens. We see it in the church all the time. God still used him because when they cut his hair off, he lost his strength. It says about him that when, when that happened, he didn't know that the Holy Spirit had left him. He didn't know that the empowerment of God had left him. He was so doing his own thing that he didn't realize that what Jesus had promised, that he would, that he would be a Nazarite and that he would be anointed by God, when that last thing was done, he didn't know. I think there are so many Christians around that don't know that, they, that, the, that the Spirit of God is not in what they're doing because they're doing their own thing. It ended up, <laughs> they gouged his eyeballs out and he said to his servant as he's tied to these posts, put my hands on both of these posts. And he stuck his hands on this post and he cried out to God, said, God, just one more time anoint me. The Lord had a plan, even with this faulty man. And he pushed the pillars out, and there were 3,000 on the top of the building. And he killed more Philistines in his death than he did his whole life. But here's the point I want you to see. I don't believe Samson had to live that way. I think he could have had the glory and the grace of God on his life the whole time if he would have just been subservient the ways of God. God says to you, baby, I'm all you need. I'm your everything. Put your hope in me. Trust in me. The next story I want to talk about is found in Luke chapter 17. Yeah, Luke chapter 17. I'm pretty sure it's Luke chapter 17 now that I'm thinking about it. It's the, it's the, uh, it's the ten lepers. The ten lepers. And there are ten lepers and they're kind of standing off. And Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem. He's walking down the road and he's kind of going through the Galilean territory. And he comes to these little, you know, they got little huts and cities that are set up. And he comes and there are ten lepers kind of standing off over here. And they look at him and, and they know that this is the Savior. And they kind of call out to him. For him to come over there and heal them. And Jesus just hollers back and says, go show yourself to the priest. Well, they know what the law is. The law is when you're healed from leprosy, you go to the priest and there's this, 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 uh, this uh, directions in Leviticus that tells the priest how to deal with leprosy. And so they know that that's what, and it says, on their way to the priests, they were healed. And that word for healed right there is sozo. No, it's not actually there. It's, that's a different word. Anyhow, they were healed of their leprosy. It's a different Greek word. Their leprosy. And then this one comes back as Jesus had instructed. Y'all go share yourself to priest and then come back. And then he come back. Only one comes back, right? That one comes back and he... He bows at the feet of Jesus and he says, Master, Savior. And Jesus looks at him and says, Your faith has made you well. And that word for well is sozo. And that means that everything that the curse did in your life, you've been free of. You've been freed of everything that Satan has heaped upon you. Where are the other nine? Now here's the point I want you to hear. Did the other nine get healed of leprosy? They did. Where were they? They didn't receive sozo. And God says, where are they at? Here I am. I'm all you need. Come to me and you can have sozo. You can be healed inside out. Everything about you can be healed physical, spiritual, Financial, you can receive your sozo from me because you can be in relationship with me and I will lead you into all things. One out of ten. One out of ten. 
the woman with the issue of blood. It's found in Mark. I think it's in the fourth chapter. There's a woman that comes with an issue of blood, and this is what it says about her, that she had, she had spent all of her life savings going to doctors for the last 12 years. And I know this is a, this is a beautiful passage of Scripture. But one of the things that I have to just know in my heart is that she expended every ounce of resources she had to be healed before she came to the one who could actually heal her. Sometimes that's not talked about in that story. And I know she was desperate, and she said in her mind, all I have to do is touch him, and I'll be healed. And she reached out, she touched him, and Jesus said, power has gone from me. And everybody around said, I, you know, how, how in the world, how do you know that power's gone? And, and he said, I, you know, I felt the power go, somebody was healed, and she, and she piped up. Now, there's a couple of things you need to know about that story. First of all, if you were, had an issue of bleeding for 12 years in that culture, you were unclean. You were considered unclean, and you couldn't touch anybody. She, we, she pressed into the crowd, so that made everybody in the crowd unclean as well. And then she touched Jesus, which made him unclean as well, except what happened was the inverse. She pressed in. She touched all these people. She touched Jesus. Instead of becoming unclean, instead of him becoming unclean, she became clean. And nobody around her accused her ever again of being unclean. And neither were they unclean because they didn't even recognize what unclean, that unclean was among them. And it all happened just like that. But I just got to think to myself, you know, God wants us to come to him first. He, he wants us to, to know that he is where our sufficiency is. And then we go, we go, we seek out physicians. We've got physicians here. And I certainly am attended by a physician. But we know that they practice medicine and we serve the great healer, Right? I mean, we ain't got that figured out either. They'll tell you. They don't have it figured out. And we come to the Lord and, and just think what's available. Now, I want to say all that. Now, listen to what God is saying. He is saying to you and me that I'm all you need. Come to me. I've got blessing. Don't just get healed of one thing in your life. Receive sozo. Don't stop doing things your own way because it looks good to your eye and refuse to pursue the ways of God because you're not going to get healed in every arena. What we do is we compartmentalize and we bring these areas to God and he heals them. Bring your life to God and let him heal you because he wants to bring it all. And watch what this says. Listen to what Isaiah says. In chapter 30, I kind of like Isaiah too. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 30. I'm going to read this for the message. It's going to be on your screen so that you can follow along with me. Isaiah chapter 30. Now you've got to remember that he's talking to the church. So when he says Israel or children, he's talking to the people of God. And it's not, it's not a nation. The only thing that makes it a nation is that God is the king. That makes it a nation. You understand that? That he didn't want a president. He didn't want that. What he wanted was to be king. And he is going to be king. He's going to rule and reign. Doom rebel children. Let me start with 24. <laughs> the reason I have to is because it's just what it says. It doesn't have anything to do with what I'm talking about. But it's a good setup. Verse 24 of 29. Those who got off track will get back on track. And complainers and whiners will learn gratitude. That's just good all by itself. Somebody say amen. Okay, let me keep going. He says, doom, rebel children. God's decree. You make plans, but not my plans. You make deals, but not in my spirit. You pile sin on sin, one sin on top of another. 
You go off to Egypt. Now, when it says Egypt, he's talking about a governmental system, a way of thinking that is worldly and contrary to the ways of God. When he says Egypt, that's all he's talking about. I don't want you to think about a nation. I want you to think about that these ways are not God's ways. These are practices that are, that are different than what God says. And he says this, you're going off to Egypt without so much as asking me. You're running off to Pharaoh, or you could say the president of the United States, for protection, expecting to hide out in Egypt. Well, some protection Pharaoh will be. Some hideout you got there. Egypt, God is basically saying this, you got to be kidding me. They look big and important, true, with officials strategically established in Zion in the uh, Zoan in the north and Haines in the south. But there's nothing to them. Anyone stupid enough to trust them will end up looking stupid. All show, no substance, an embarrassing farce. And this note on the animals of the Negev encounter on the road to Egypt. A most dangerous, treacherous route that you could take is that road going to Egypt. You're menaced by lions and deadly snakes, and you're down to, uh, you're going to lug all your stuff down there. Your donkeys and your camels are loaded down with bribes, thinking you can buy protection from that hollow farce of a nation. Egypt is all show and no substance. My name is for my name for her is Toothless Dragon. So go now and write all this down. Listen, put it in a book so that the record will be there to instruct the coming generations. Because this is a rebel generation. A people who lie a people unwilling to listen to anything that God tells them. They tell their spiritual leaders, don't bother us with irre irrelevancies. And they're talking about the word. They tell their preachers, don't waste our time on impracticalities. Tell us what makes us feel better. Don't bore us with obsolete religion. That stuff means nothing to us. Quit hounding us with the holy of Israel. Therefore, <laughs> the holy of Israel says this, because you scorn the message, preferring to live by injustice and shape your lives on lies, this perverse way of life will be like a towering, badly built wall that slowly, slowly tilts and shifts and then one day, without warning, collapses. Smashed to bits like a piece of pottery. Smashed beyond recognition or repair. Unless a pile of debris to be, a useless pile of debris to be swept up and thrown into the trash. God, the Master, the Holy One of Israel, has this solemn course. Your salvation requires you to turn back to me and stop your silly efforts to save yourself. Your strength will come from settling down in complete dependence on me. The very thing you've been unwilling to do, you said nothing doing. We'll rush off on horseback, and you'll rush off all right, just not far enough. <laughs> you said, we'll ride off on fast horses. Do you think your pursuers ride old nags? <laughs> think again. A thousand of you will scatter before one attacker. Before a mere five, you'll, run, you'll all run off. There'll be nothing left of you. A flagpole on a hill with no flag. A signpost on a roadside with the sign torn off. But God's not finished. He, He is waiting 
around to be gracious to you. And I love that. I love that thought. No matter, no matter how off track we get, no matter how weird our thinking becomes, no matter how much sin comes into our lives, no matter how we begin to follow the world system of thinking, no matter how that is, our God is waiting around on a nation and a church to be gracious to us. His posture and His position is to be gracious on this nation. His, he's gathering strength to show mercy to you. You know, God takes the time to do everything right. Everything. Those who wait around for him are the lucky ones. Oh, yes, people of Zion, citizens of Jerusalem. Church, your time of cheers is over. Cry for help. You will find its grace and more grace. You'll find it's the power of God. And then more power of God. The moment he hears. He'll answer. I think that's good. The banner over me is love. Jesus says. Come to me. All you who are heavy laden and I'll give you rest. Peace I give to you. Not like the world gives do I give, but peace that is out of this world. He's saying to the church this hour, don't be fearful. Turn to my ways. Don't line up with a worldly way of thinking. Don't line up with a political party. Your political party is called kingdom. You hear me? That's the church's responsibility is to be kingdom and to pray for our government. Pray for the leaders that are in charge. We don't need to pray that Donald Trump's going to fail. That's like getting in an airplane and praying that the pilot fail. We don't, that's not the posture of the church. The posture of the church is to believe that our God is in control. And he is able to save a nation. And that he's looking for our nation to begin to order itself after the ways of the kingdom of God. And when we do, he says, he is waiting to be gracious to us and have mercy upon us. I'm encouraged, church, today, because I believe that's who you are. I believe that's who this church is. When we had that guest speaker last week, he said, you've been to 60 churches in this city. And there wasn't a church that he came to that worshiped the Lord in an intercessory way like Eastside Church. He said, this place wants to go get the kingdom of God. I believe that's who you are. But listen, we're not proud. We've got a long way to go. We don't understand God like we need to. He wants to reveal more and more our attitude as a church and as individuals is to line up with him so the graciousness of God will be poured out and his mercy will be poured out in our lives, in our families, in our communities, and in our nation. Amen? Amen. Let's stand for closing prayer. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask our prayer team to go ahead and come.
Now they're here. You guys know, and I say it every week. Let's utilize them. I mean, if you found yourself buying into, I mean, I, I just really want to say anything the media said. Either side. And, and really, in the whole campaign, either side. I don't believe hardly anything that's been said either side, to be honest with you. I, I mean, it's hard to discern what's even been said and whether they're going to carry out anything they said or not. But that doesn't matter to me because my God is on the throne. My God can order the things day by day. So I don't worry about that. So, I, you know, I just want to pray right now. I mean, we've got, you know, we've got an, a, a large contingent of African-American people in this congregation. Not big enough. You guys need to get to work. <laughs> but I know that there's, uh, there's really, you know, that there's a reason to be. You know, the, 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 it can get your attention. And, and you know, we have a, a Hispanic, large Hispanic community in this church. And that can get your attention right now. You know, but don't, don't let it distract you from being what God created you to be. And that's the church. We're kingdom. And God's going to carry out his plan if the church will posture himself before the Lord. And, let, and let's begin to do that. And, 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 let's, and let's just, when we hear rhetoric from a Christian that's outside kingdom, let, let, let's graciously pull that into kingdom thinking. Let's don't align ourselves with garbage talk. Let's bring that back into the love of God, which Stephen read right up front. So, Father... We stand before you and we know and depend upon your power, power after power after power, that you've got an anointing on the lives of men, whether they are following you or not, to carry out your purposes. We trust that, God, because you are good and you are kind, and you have won. It is finished for you, God. And I pray as your, as your body that we would line up with you, that we would hear your word, that we would want to know it more now than ever in self-defense so that we don't be, we're not fooled or we don't go astray. kingdom people listen <laughs> this is so good you're going to have to pray for me next service I ain't got much left <clears throat> I heard this this week or last week or the week before it's so good Somebody was talking about the church. That's us. And they said this. How many of you have heard, I've, I, I've, been, I've been adopted into the family of God. How many of you heard that? I'm adopted. Everybody, you, you've heard that in Ephesians? You read that in Scripture? Just three of us? How many have heard that? I need participation. You've heard that, right? You, you've heard that you're an adopted son or daughter. Have you heard that? Have you heard that? How many of you heard this? I'm adopted into the Trinity. What is the family of God? The family of God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You are adopted into the family of the Trinity. If God be for me, who can be against me? Amen. There are people you know that need healing. You might need healing. You might need to just realign yourself with God and say anything that's contrary to your way of thinking, God, I'm not thinking it. You might need somebody to pray. Maybe you know somebody that's fearful. Maybe you know somebody, uh, I'm looking back here at you, Joe, that, that, aren't, that aren't legal citizens. They're really scared. 
We need to pray a pathway of success for that. You know, we need to pray that love would abound. We need to pray that God would do miraculous stuff to make it, uh, to make it where we can live in peace. Amen? You may know people like that that need the peace of God in this time. Let's pray for them. Let's take advantage of it. Let's pray for those who need healing. And let's pray for our families that we would stand strong in the Lord. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Y'all have a great week. I finished at 1035. Write this down. Amen? God bless you. Y'all get prayer.